House will be answered by the member for Gordon. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? And I give the call to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. How much will small businesses have to pay to participate in multi-employer bargaining according to the specific modelling contained in the government's own regulatory impact statement? I give the call to the Minister for Small Business, the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Age. member for her question. I assume that she's referring to the regulatory impact statement that uh, has been prepared for the bill, and as she would know, that small businesses already incur costs when they try and enter the bargaining system. She would also know, of course, that many small businesses are actually represented by an employer organisation, and that reduces the their the costs. And what we know the of the opposition is will that cease small ejecting. businesses will be supported the by the Fair Work Commission the through the bargaining will process. Her seat. Order. There is far too much noise. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition was heard in silence, and the Minister will be heard in silence. I give the call to the Deputy Leader on a point of order. A point of order on relevance, Mr Speaker. My question asked how much, under the government's own regulatory impact statement, yep. extra would small businesses have to pay? You may resume so your seat. You may resume your seat. Order. Members on my right. I'll hear from the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, on two points. One, on the uh, direct relevance point of order that was just taken, uh, the question that was just stated was a different phrasing to the question that was asked. Uh, and secondly, the immediate shouting while the Minister is here from the Leader of the Opposition is just off the charts at the moment. Order. Order. There is far too much noise. I appreciate the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is entitled to make a point of order. You're not entitled to then add extra things into the question. The minister should be heard in silence. This is the first question. I'm asking the House to come to order. The minister is in order. She's referring directly to what the, the, she was asked about, and she's concluded her answer. And I give the, uh, give the call to the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to table page 53 of the regulatory impact statement which says that the cost of to small businesses is $14,638 if they are dragged into this okay. compulsory process. Is, is leave order. Is order. The, the Leader of the Nationals is not helping. I give the call to the Leader of the House. Yeah, is leave uh, granted? Mr Speaker, he might not realise it's already a public document, so therefore it doesn't need to be tabled. Leave's not granted. All right. The manager will resume his seat. The leader will resume his seat. The House will come to order so I can hear from the member for Macquarie. Thank you, Speaker. My questions to the Prime Minister. How is the government supporting communities, small businesses and not-for-profits affected by flooding? Give a call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, this morning I was in Yagara with the Premier of New South Wales, Dominic Perrottet, with the member for Calair and the member for Orange, as well as being escorted around by the Mayor, Kevin Beattie, uh, looking at the devastation which Yagara has faced. Uh, this repeated, relentless flooding that is occurring is just so hard for these communities. Uh, Forbes that I visited. Uh, with uh, Premier Perrottet a couple of weeks ago, of course, has been hit again. And today we had uh, the opportunity, we flew uh, into parks and then flew over uh, the communities that had been impacted. In Yagara's case, 159 people, or one in every three residents, had to be rescued by either a helicopter or by a boat. And I pay tribute to the emergency services, to the Australian Defence Force personnel who were on the ground the very next day, to the SES, but also to the average people from New South Wales who have driven to Yagara to just help people clean up and get their lives back. Uh, today uh, we announced a $50,000 recovery grant up to $25,000 to be automatic, the next $25,000 to be on the basis of, of receipts being produced for small business and not-for-profits for these communities, as well as now extending the $1 million local government recovery grant now to 46 
councils that have been disaster declared in New South Wales. Uh, we met with uh, Brendan Mainsbridge and David Herbert, who run uh, the local uh, Yagara post office, which is not just the post office, it's the bank, it's, it's the full bit. And uh, they have got it all up and running uh, within days, an amazing uh, achievement uh, by them. Uh, this community uh, is an inspirational one. It has been able to, to fight its way back. Uh, this government has their back, as does the New South Wales government, and as does, of course, local government as well. We'll continue to work with state and territory governments as we have in New South Wales, in Tasmania, in Victoria, and now in South Australia, as also facing a really difficult period uh, going ahead. Uh, that's what people expect, that's what they deserve and that's what they'll get from my government. I, I thank the fact that the Acting Prime Minister, Richard Miles, visited the community as well as the Minister for Emergency Services, Murray Watt, who's done such an extraordinary job uh, since he was appointed uh, to that position. Uh, I say to all those uh, who have been impacted by this. Uh, the whole of Australia feels for you. We realise that you are doing it really, really tough, and we will stand by you in these difficult times. And on indulgence, the Leader of the Nationals. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Just on indulgence, can I associate not only the Nationals but the Coalition, uh, not only with the Prime Minister's fine words, but his efforts to get there uh, this morning. And the member for Clare and I spoke just before question time, and he appreciated the fact that you engaged openly and honestly, not just with him, but with the community. And it's important this parliament continues to work together to make sure on this long journey, day by day, step by step, we support those communities that have been impacted. So thank you, Prime Minister. Give the call to the member for Hume. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I refer to, uh, I, my question is to the Minister for Small Business. I refer to the Minister's previous Get answer. The Can Order. the Minister Order. now confirm the government's regulatory impact statement predicts the cost for small businesses to negotiate in the new multi-enterprise industrial relations system is between $14,000 and $75,000. I give the call to the Minister for Small Business, Housing and Homelessness. I member thank the member page. for his question. As uh, the, Order, the member opposite will left. be aware, more than two million businesses are actually exempt from the single interest stream bargaining system. More than two million, 90 per cent of all Australian businesses, that is. He would also know, as I said earlier, that many businesses already incur costs and that many businesses are already covered the by their Longman. employer peak organisation. He would also be aware that our expectation is, is that most small businesses would be in the cooperative stream where they can use off-the-shelf agreements. Order. Order. Members on my left, the member for Hume will cease interjecting. The House will come to order so I can hear from the member for Canberra. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Science. Can the Minister tell us about the Prime Minister's prizes for science and what the Albanese Labor government is doing to prioritise science? I give the call to the Minister for Industry and Science. I'd like to thank the member uh, because the member knows, as we all do, that science plays an exceptionally important role in uh, solving complex problems, improving the quality of life and, and national well-being. And we are a country that are blessed uh, with an overwhelming amount of smart people uh, who are applying their know-how in ways that are making a difference both here and in the global community. And our history is littered with great examples of this as well. Uh, for example, the late uh, Professor Frank Fenner, a biologist whose work contributed to the eradication of smallpox, an Australian who did great things for us here and overseas. And it's right and fitting that we find ways to celebrate and encourage others down the same path, which is exactly what we did with the Prime Minister's awards for science uh, here last night. Um, and after a two-week break due to COVID, we brought together the nation's scientific and research community in the Great Hall. And can I say it was a great honour for both the two-year break uh, for, uh, for that, and uh, it was a great honour for the Prime Minister, myself and other parliamentarians uh, to be able to witness the achievements recognised through those prizes. And, Speaker, we are honoured by the presence of many of those recipients here in the gallery today. Thank you for your great work. <laughs> 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 
Speaker, the, the PM Science Prize recipient, Professor, uh, Pr Professor Trevor McDowell, Dougal, I should say, his study of ocean thermodynamics improves the accuracy of how we model the effects of climate change, uh, and his work is used by oceanographers world over. And Speaker, as we know, in the fight against climate change, listening to science matters. The prize has also recognised excellence in science teaching. Yep. Overwhelming to see the passion from both uh, George Panatsis uh, from Marble Bar Primary School in East Pilbara and Veena Nair from Viewbank College uh, in Melbourne, both building enthusiasm uh, and curiosity for science and ideas in the next generation. It also recognised top new innovators like Dr Pip Carroley from Melbourne, whose work is improving the tracking and treating of epilepsy based on her research into seizure forecasting. Uh, and her work shows why we need to believe and have faith in our ideas. Our government knows this, and that's why we're looking to attract and retain talent through a diverse STEM uh, workforce pipeline. Our reconstruction fund will help back commercialisation of Australian discoveries, like the types uh, encouraged by Associate Professor Brett Hallam, who's worked to commercialise research that dramatically improved the performance of solar cells by a mighty 10 per cent. Not a small feat, and well done. He received the PM Science uh, a PM's Prize for New Innovators. And finally, if I may, can we just also uh, acknowledge and thank Professor Graham Durant for his outstanding 19 years of service to Questacon, also known as the Shrine to Grateful Parents across the country. <laughs> uh, distinguished service to the nation and the science well community. Well done to Graham. On yeah. indulgence, the Prime Minister and then the manager. Thank, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I just uh, as that was the Prime Minister's Science Awards, very much associate uh, myself uh, with the comments of the Minister. It was a terrific evening uh, last night. You certainly improved substantially the IQ of this building with your presence. I assure you, I speak on behalf of all of us here. That isn't a partisan comment. Uh, you are inspirational uh, with your intellectual contribution. And uh, we certainly respect science and we honour your contribution. Yeah. And the Manager of Opposition Business, on indulgence. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, on indulgence, I associate the uh, Opposition with the uh, comments that have been made about the Prime Minister's uh, Prize for Science. Extend our congratulations to all of the winners, a very impressive and distinguished collection of Australians. I particularly want to mention the two uh, awards uh, for teach science teaching, George Panatsis and Veena Nair. And the diversity, both in terms of gender and uh, background, uh, national background of those who won awards, was particularly noticeable and speaks volumes for Australia as a nation. Give a call to the member for Goldstein. To the Minister for Workplace Relations. Goldstein has 17,000 small businesses, and the government's industrial relations bill captures businesses with a headcount of just 15 plus. This would see thousands of small businesses across the country potentially drawn into multi-employer bargaining. Overall, I have supported the bill. However, does the government accept Order. that the number should be raised to a higher number of full-time equivalent staff to acknowledge the concerns of our small businesses? I give the call to the Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Minister for the Arts. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting every time a minister starts answering a question. And I give the call to the Leader of the House. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Goldstone for the question. I uh, acknowledge the member uh, for different parts of this bill, particularly on the gender equity parts of the bill, uh, had been an advocate for those, those sections of the bill long before she became uh, a member in this place. And since becoming a member, uh, this, is, this is the first time um, in question time that the members raised it with me, but it's been raised both on the floor of the House and privately, uh, and I think in writing uh, to me as well. So uh, I respect the, the fierce advocacy of this issue of the small, how the small business carve-out is done. Uh, I'll say a few things in response. Uh, first of all, and it goes to some of the issues that have been raised by the opposition today as well, the expectation with respect to small business is overwhelmingly to be the cooperative stream that's used. Uh, and with the cooperative stream, it's very much an opt-in. There's no industrial action. Uh, effectively, uh, model, if you like, uh, enterprise agreements are made available that small businesses and their staff can voluntarily opt into. Uh, that involves no fees, no consultants, and we expect overwhelmingly that would be the way that small business would engage with these reforms. With respect to the single interest stream, the small business carve-out that is there at the moment 
uh, is simply the definition that is already elsewhere in the Act for Small Business, a definition which those opposite did not seek to change in their entire time uh, in office. I respect the argument that the member for Goldstone and other members of the crossbench have made uh, where they've said that particularly for Māori uh, employer bargaining, they would like to see this go a as a broader uh, exclusion, and that's been raised not only by the member for Goldstone but by a number of members of the crossbench. This is one of the issues where consultation and negotiation is happening with the Senate crossbench. Uh, as I said, when we're in the in detail stage, as I said, we're in the in detail stage. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. As I said when we Member were dealing with the in detail stage, so this might be new for those who haven't been paying attention, but not new uh, for those who have. Uh, there has always been an expectation that when the bill hit the Senate, that definition would probably Latrobe be something Deacon, that was part of those negotiations. In any broadening of the definition, what I want to be mindful of, and I've said this before, is while occupations such as such as early, early childhood educators, uh, who we definitely want to make sure do get the benefit of multi employer bargaining, uh, that they may start in the supported stream, but effectively, if you look at businesses like, for example, the Victorian childcare centres or early childhood education centres that have already uh, engaged in this, they're now roughly 16 per cent above the award, and they would need a pathway to be able to continue to. Uh, negotiate. They'd only be able to do that single enterprise stream, and I want to make sure that any expanded definition doesn't carve them out. Give a call to the member for Benelong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering for small business owners and employees? Give it order. Members on my left will be. The minister will be heard in silence. There is far too much noise on my left. Give the, the member for Fadden give the call to the Minister for Small Business, Housing and Homelessness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Ben Long for his question. He, like many in this place, is a strong advocate for small businesses and supports small businesses Order. in his electorate. Indeed, millions of Australia's small businesses are at the heart of our communities, as I've said in this place before. And they, of course, uh, have $430 billion contribution to our economy each and every year. We know that when small businesses are doing well, the economy is doing well and Australians are doing well. That's why we have taken action to deliver support for small businesses to remain more resilient and competitive. We've updated the Commonwealth procurement rules, which will mean small businesses get a bigger slice of the $70 billion each year that go in government tenders, uh, with a target of 20 per cent. Mr. Speaker. Indeed, we've passed the unfair contract legislation, something those opposite talked about for nine years but actually couldn't deliver, already through the parliament in less the than six months. Indeed, as part of the budget, we committed to provide $15.1 million for small business owners across Australia who are having issues with mental health. It's free mental health and indeed for uh, the debt hotline. This is targeted support the member for, for small will businesses cease that need it, the like for Claire Kareem, and my we'll electorate. Cease interjecting. The minister will continue. Like Claire and my electorate, who I was talking to about the value of these programs. These programs were due to finish at the 31st of December this year, but we made room in our budget to make sure these critical programs are continuing. And indeed, we're delivering $62.6 million in energy efficient grants to small and medium businesses that are eligible to help them with rising energy costs, Mr. Speaker. And this week, we're introducing a bill into the House to implement the skills and training boost and the technology investment boost, Mr. Speaker. These incentives will help small and medium businesses with digital technology adaption and indeed to train their workforce to make them more uh, digitally with digital capacity. They're worth more than $1.5 billion. These measures will be backdated to the 29th of March to make sure that small businesses can receive the benefits of these. And I'll be Manager having a meeting subjective. of state and territory business ministers in December of this year, Mr Order. Speaker. Something those opposite didn't do for the nine years they were in government, almost a decade, they couldn't meet with the other the ministers Monk, to talk about the importance of small businesses and the how they of the support small businesses working the with the states and territories. Warned. And of course,
course, we are making changes to the industrial relations system, a system that the Council of Small Business Organisations said was inaccessible and intimidating for small businesses. We are making changes because we believe in modernising the workplace and getting wages moving. Small businesses are at the heart of all our decisions and they will continue to be so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Order. I give the call to the Manager of Opposition Business. Well, Mr Speaker, I ask that the minister table the document from which she was reading. Was the minister reading from a public document? A confidential document. <laughs> I, give the order. I give the call to the member for Barker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Small Business. I refer to the minister's previous answer. Can the minister inform the House how many businesses will have to pay between $14,000 and $75,000 under the new industry bargaining system? Order. I give the call to the Minister for Small Business, the Minister for Housing and the Minister for Homelessness. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member there for his question. As I said here, more than two million businesses are exempt from this, this stream, this bargaining the of the stream opposition. that they're talking about. Seriously, it's 90 per cent of all Australian businesses that are exempt. Indeed, we expect Hunter. that most small businesses, as the minister has said, will be in the cooperative stream. And most of them, of course, are already members of employer organisations, so they have little or no cost for the Member bargaining Barker if they choose to opt in. That is the point. That is what they're missing over there. More than two million businesses are exempt from the stream. Give the call to the member for McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How is the Albanese Labor government progressing action on climate change domestically and internationally? And what will this mean for Australian families and businesses? I give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question and recognise his leadership and advocacy on the matter of climate change. And of course, the Albanese government is acting domestically, implementing the policies we took to the election, implementing rewiring the nation to bring on new transmission, Mr. Speaker, implementing reforms to drive down emissions. Because we know, on this side of the house that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, and we know that renewable energy is key to driving down our emissions, Mr Speaker. But also we are engaging internationally, and as the House knows, I've just, just returned from Egypt at the Conference of the Parties. And I'm pleased to report, Mr Speaker, that the government was warmly welcomed, the new government was warmly welcomed at the Conference of the Parties, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to Pleased to report to the House that the leadership provided by the government has been recognised around the world. And the I'm also pleased Fairfax to report, Mr. Speaker, that we used the opportunity of the Conference of the Parties, which is now the world's largest trades fair, to sell Australia's wares as a renewable energy powerhouse. Because we know, we know that being a renewable energy powerhouse will create hundreds of thousands of jobs across our country, particularly in the regions. And particularly, Mr. Speaker, Member as we Petrie. can export that renewable energy to our region, and this is something that was the subject of much discussion around the tables with my counterparts from the South East Asia region, in particular, Mr. Speaker. And also, the conference of the parties, the COP meeting, is of course also an important opportunity for the world to engage on this most important challenge. And Australia played an important role, Mr. Speaker. This conference was difficult; it had its, had its challenges. But Australia, working with our allies and friends, made an impact. And I was very pleased that this conference reaffirmed the commitments made at Glasgow to hold the world to as close as possible to 1.5 degrees, something that Australia was integrally involved in arguing. I'm also pleased that the conference adopted our suggestion that multilateral development banks, particularly the World Bank, should step up on this world challenge, and that the task of driving faster transitions to renewables was reflected in these decisions. This is what leadership is about, Mr Speaker. This is the leadership that the Prime Minister has been providing this week and since the election on these most important international challenges, and this is being recognised because we know, the the we know that good rejecting. international leadership is good for our region and good for our geopolitical and economic best interests, Mr Speaker, as well as being the right thing to do. 
I enjoyed working so closely with Pacific leaders this week, Mr. Speaker, who have responded so warmly to this government's agenda on climate change. I enjoyed working with them on some of the important challenges that this COP, uh, this COP provided. And we'll continue to do that work because we know that leadership at home and leadership abroad are equally important when it comes to this most important challenge. Yeah. I'm waiting for a question. Thank you. Give the The member MacArthur will resume his seat. I give the call to the member Mitchell. Thank you, Speaker. It has been a decade since I asked a question. Um, my question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. At a time when Australian families are being hit by Labor's price hikes in electricity and gas, why on earth did this government sign up to a new United Nations fund which will channel Australian taxpayers' money to other countries, including China? Order. Order. There is far too much. Oh. There is far too much noise. The Minister for Defence, Industry, and the Minister for International Development and Pacific is making far too much. Members on my right will come to order, so I can hear the minister in silence. I give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. For noticing the shoes. They set you up. That was the biggest setup since Catherine Deeves. <laughs> Order. There is far too much noise on my right and my left. When the House comes to order, I'm issuing a general warning. There is far too much noise in the chamber. I give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's unsurprising, perhaps, to get a question like that from this opposition, led by a man who thinks that. The impact on the Pacific of climate change is a laughing matter, Mr Speaker. Who thinks it's a great big joke? Because we don't on this side of the House, Mr Speaker. We will work with the Pacific because we know, we know that that is in our interests as a country in a very complicated geopolitical environment, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, Member not only Barker, does Member this opposition Groom. engage in this sort of cheap, this cheap dog whistling politics, Mr Speaker, they also don't even know what was agreed. They don't even know it was agreed, and I'm surprised to get a question like this from a man who was the Minister for the Pacific, Mr Speaker. That's the best they can do. He was the man in charge of our relations with our region, Mr Speaker. The Minister will take a break. I will hear on a point of order from the member for Mitchell. Thank you, Speaker. It's on relevance. The Minister wasn't listening to the question. I asked why the money was going to China, was the question, not the Pacific. Uh, the, the point of order, the minister is being relevant. The question was a very broad question, and he is being entirely relevant. I give him the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I guess if you were the minister for the Pacific and you didn't actually go to the Pacific, that's probably the sort of point of order you would take, Mr. Speaker. The other, the other point of order you would take, if you'd asked a question like that, is that one of relevance, because, because Mr. Speaker, the opposition appears unaware that, in fact. As part of these negotiations and as part of these discussions, Australia, Australia argued and successfully argued that the donor base should be reviewed so that those countries that weren't rich in 1992 but have now become developed and are now wealthy should contribute, not receive, should contribute to the fund, Mr Speaker. That, that might have passed you by. On my left. That might have passed you by because that's exactly what we argued. And we were joined by by the United States and the European Union and Canada and the New Minister Zealand, Mr. Speaker. So, the member for I, I, understand, I understand the difference between donor and recipient might be a little bit confusing to those opposite, Mr. Speaker. But that's exactly what we argued, and that was exactly reflected by the text, which indicates a multiplicity of donors and a revision of the donor base, Mr. Speaker. So, if the opposition is going to go down this cheap and nasty road, they want to at least get their facts right, Mr. Speaker. Because previous Prime Ministers have understood that engagement on these issues is important. John Howard knew that in the aftermath of the tsunami. He knew that contributing to Indonesia's recovery was good for Indonesia, good for our region and good for Australia. But, Mr Speaker, John Howard was a leader. John Howard was a leader who understood our national interest. The current leader of the opposition does not understand the national interest. He just understands cheap and pathetic politics. Give the call to the order. 
I give the call to the member for MacArthur. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. What is the Albanese Labor government doing to reform the childcare system it inherited, whilst also providing cost of living relief for families? Give the call to the Minister for Education. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank my friend, the member for MacArthur, for his question. Some good news. The Senate is on the cusp of voting for our cheaper childcare legislation. They could vote on it as early as tonight. And as you know, Mr. Speaker, this was one of the biggest and most important commitments that we made at the last election. It's almost a $5 billion investment. To put that in perspective, that's about as much as the former government spent on submarines and didn't deliver as much as a periscope. <laughs> but this will deliver something real. This will cut the cost of early education and care for more than one million Australian families. That's real cost of living help. For a family on a combined Leader income of, of 120 grand, it will cut the cost by about $1,700 a year. That will really help. But not just that. This is real economic reform because if you cut the cost of early education and care, it makes it easier for parents to go back to work, in particular for mothers to go back to more paid work, work more hours or work more days. That means more skilled workers back in the workforce. And, and definitely most important of all, it helps our children. More time in early education and care means you're better prepared for school. So it's the trifecta. It's good for children, it's good for parents, and it's good for our economy. That's why Australians the voted for it. The That's why we're delivering it. Even in the face of full-blown opposition right. over the last two years and continuing to this day by the leader of the National Party, who we can hear interjecting here today, over the course of the debate in the House and the Senate, the not one the person is on a said warning. one thing positive about this legislation, except for my old friend, the member for New England, who unfortunately seems to have disappeared. <laughs> but the member for New England, the former leader of the National Party, said this was manifestly good. Manifestly good. I don't agree with Barnaby on everything, but he is right here. This is manifestly good. And this is just the start. The next is the ACCC inquiry into the cost of early education and care. And that will kick off in January and report an interim report to us in June. Next year will also kick off a big and broad review of early education and care, done by the Productivity Commission. This is important work to set us up for the future. Just as universal Medicare gives Australians the health care they need and deserve, just as universal super helps to make sure that we can retire with the security that Australians deserve, this will help us to build the universal early education system that will give every Australian child the opportunity that they deserve. Give the call to the member for Page. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. In Lismore on the 28th of October, when asked whether the flood disaster grants would be taxed, the Prime Minister said there has been no suggestion that they would be taxed. Does the Prime Minister stand by this statement? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for Page for his question. I'm surprised, frankly, that he's asked it. A lot of confusion I'm the surprised Page has asked his question. that he's asked it in that way, given that he travelled with me uh, to 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 the, uh, the to Lismore with the Premier of uh, of New South Wales, and also, of course, uh, with the member for Richmond, joined us on that occasion. Effectively, what occurs with the system is that payments are made, and once it's expended, it becomes a tax deduction. So it is, in effect, not a tax. It doesn't attract real tax. That is the Deputy situation. The that is the situation. And 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 if if you if you made it if you made it uh, tax-free up front or what have you, then what you would do potentially is gain people could gain money from it. So the grant, the grant is paid, some of it, some of it without receipts, as you would be aware, as you would be aware, and then uh, once it's expended it becomes a deduction. Just like 
the grants that we've made uh, today, which is the same way that it has always operated. Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? Yep. I give the call. I give the call to the order. Members on my left, I'd like to hear the member for Hasluck, and I could give her the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the member, Employment. The member for Page, the member for Hasluck will resume her seat. The member for the member for Page will cease interjecting. The member for the member the member for Page. The member for Page will cease interjecting. We're moving to the next. The member for Page will cease interjecting. The member for Page will cease interjecting, and the House will come to order. The member for Lyons give the call to the, the attorney. The attorney general. The attorney general will cease interjecting. The Attorney General is warned. The member for River Arena is warned. The House will come. The member for River Arena is on a warning. The House will come to order so I can hear the member for Hasler. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Can the minister explain how some commentary around the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill is just plain wrong? What will the actual impacts of the legislation be? Give a call to the, man, to the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations and Minister for the Arts. Thanks so much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Hasluck. There's been few questions I've welcomed. As much as I welcome being asked, is there anything that's been said on this bill that's just plain wrong? Uh, because even as I've sat here in question time, a new one happened. Um, I wasn't prepared that I was going to get up and talk about the Shadow Treasurer. Uh, but the Shadow Treasurer, in his question, referred to small business and a figure of $75,000. So I went straight to, to the advisers' box and got them to check with the department. Is there anywhere in that document where that figure is referred to for small business? And it's nowhere. It's nowhere. No reference to small business. The seventy-five thousand dollars figure again. Now, I've now got them. Though, I've now got them googling because he may have uploaded something to the internet somewhere where there's a different document involving that figure. But even in question time, even in question time, the misrepresentation has continued because the day began with misrepresentation. Right on cue, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has gone to the advisers' box too, because the Deputy Leader of the Opposition gave a great comment this morning. As part of their, their anger and frustration about the concept of workers getting wages moving, she said, and I quote, These businesses will be forced to the table under multi-employer bargaining. They are businesses that, for example, may pay above the award, may be on enterprise agreements. If you're on an enterprise agreement, you are ineligible, ineligible for multi-employer bargaining. The, I'm the sorry, deputy leader of the opposition will cease Stop interjecting. Digging. Stop digging. <laughs> so already this morning, start of the day, early comments in the media conference. These are the comments that are prepared, just like the shadow treasurer's question today. Prepared with information that is wrong, that is wrong on the face of documents tabled in this parliament wrong on the face of documents that are publicly available. They're not the only scare campaigns. We had in the, in the debate for a suspension only this morning again being told that we needed to bring the bill back in because they were opposed to sector-wide and industry-wide bargaining. The bill doesn't have sector-wide and industry-wide bargaining. It has multi-employer bargaining where either the employers or their workforce have chosen and voted that they want to be part of it. But we also had in the debate—this is one of my favourites, because I think someone is in competition with Senator Cash—the Nationals MP for Mali. The Albanese government is willing to risk burning down the Australian economy with this industry-wide bargaining. And after that, this is, this is like this hits my arts portfolio part. After that, the unions will rule over the ashes. No melodrama over Order. there. No exaggeration. The Deal with the facts. We need expired. to get wages moving.
I'd like to inform the House that President of the Gallery today is a delegation from the New Zealand Parliament's Governance and Administration Committee. On behalf of the House, I extend a warm welcome to you all and I hope you're enjoying your visit to Parliament. And I give the call to the member for Wentworth. My question is for the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Australia has refused to sign a pledge to end new public subsidies for fossil fuels. These subsidies are bad for our planet and they are bad use of public money. When will the government put an end to fossil fuel subsidies? Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for her question and recognise her very keen engagement in these issues and her engagement with the government on these issues. Now, Mr. Speaker, the approach the government is taking is to implement the policies we took the election. In addition, we are engaging internationally in a range of pledges, of agreements, of alliances, which I signed last week. The opposition has criticised us for that, but we continue in that international engagement. Things like the Offshore Wind Alliance, the Net Zero Government Alliance, the Methane Pledge, which the opposition has got themselves hyperventilating, hyperventilating about, Mr. Speaker. But nevertheless, we will continue to engage. In relation, in relation to uh, the question of the honourable member, we continue to target uh, government expenditure very carefully. Uh, we have made changes in the budget, for example. Uh, we cut around half a billion dollars out of CCUS funding, for example, and reprioritised it. We cut the former uh, member's uh, UNGI program, which delivered not one watt of energy, and reprioritised that for energy storage, Mr Speaker. That is what a good government does. But what we won't do is, to be uh, very frank with the honourable member, do things like cut the diesel fuel rebate to farmers. Well, we won't be doing that, Mr Speaker. Uh, we understand the pressures and the different views, but Mr Speaker, these are arrangements that have been in place for a very long time and we do not intend to change them. I give the call to the member for Patterson. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why is it important to get wages moving again, Treasurer? And what actions is the government taking to get wages moving again after a decade of deliberately low wages? I give the call to the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the outstanding member for Patterson for her question. With that one question, Mr Speaker, she has asked almost as many questions as the Shadow Treasurer uh, since the budget was handed down a month ago. A month ago. We've had two member questions from this bloke opposite. Now, Mr Speaker, every single member of this side of the House understands that wages in this country have been stagnant for too long. Right. And we need to do Member what we Deacon. can to get wages Member moving again Hume. in this country. We all have a common interest in making sure that wages grow strongly and sustainably and that that goes hand in hand with a more productive economy as well. We want strong wages and strong profits and for Australian workers to get a fairer share of our national economic success so that when people work hard, they can get ahead and they can provide for their loved ones. And that's what motivates every single member of this side of the House. That's why we want to get wages moving again in this country. Now, in the course of the last couple of years, uh, a number of the peak business organisations have made a similar point about the need to get wages moving in this country. One of the defining failures of those opposites' decade in office the is the fact Deacon. that wages have been too stagnant for too long, and we need to change that. Now, how we go about that uh, is obviously a matter for the government to determine and for the Senate to determine. It will always be contentious in one way or another, the specific detail about how we go about this. But when we've had a decade of wage stagnation, despite low unemployment and despite skill shortages, then we do need to take a broad approach to getting wages moving again. That's why we're training people for higher wage opportunities in the budget. It's why we're making it easier for parents to work more and earn more, as the Education Minister was talking about a moment ago. That's why we're investing in industries with strong and secure well-paid jobs into the future. And that's why we are fixing a broken bargaining system because Australians need a pay rise. Working Australians deserve a pay rise. And because good wages, growing strongly and sustainably, are good for the economy as well. Now, nobody would be happier uh, than those opposite Mr Speaker than if we had another decade of wage stagnation like we have just seen in this country. The Shadow Treasurer even admitted 
on Sky News that his opposition to our proposals would be because it would see wages rise in our economy. Now we take a different approach to this economic challenge. This is one of the defining economic challenges that we confront together as a country. We want strong and sustainable wages growth because that's good for the country and it's good for the economy, and that's what motivates us every single day. I give the call to the member for Bowman. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. On the 4th of April this year in Queensland, you looked down the barrel of TV cameras and promised your plan on emission reduction would, quote, result in energy prices coming down by $275 per household, unquote. Prime Minister, will you look down the barrel of the camera now and admit to the people of Queensland that instead of your promised $275 cut, your budget locks in an electricity price increase of 56 per cent and a gas price increase of 44 per cent. The order, the House will come to order, and I'll give the call to the Prime Minister. Yeah, I, I think I'll leave looking down the barrel to the lightweight on the hill over there. <laughs> um, I, I, I thank the member uh, for, for his question. I, I, do note, I do note the comments of uh, Phil Lowe, the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, someone who has a bit of a role order. in the economy and someone who has a look at you know, energy policy and the impact. This is what he had to say to the Standing Committee on Economics on the 16th of September. He said this, the fact that Australia committed to net zero by 2050 was incredibly important. The fact that we had not signed up had people saying, are you really serious about this? We want this. Do we want to invest in Australia? The fact that we committed to it was important. Australia has great potential here with clean energy. When we were on a different path, people were saying, are they really serious? It was damaging us, and indeed it was, Mr Speaker, because four gigawatts left the system and only one gigawatt came in. Now, now if, you have, if you have an impact on that, it has an impact, it has an impact on price. But we are already, we are already acting. Uh, on our policy, which has been passed uh, through both houses of parliament, and as a result, we're already seeing the investment. You see, price is a product of investment. The prime minister will will, will take a break. The the member for Hume. It's the minister for climate change. I'm trying to take a point of order from the manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, it's on relevance. The question was very clear. $275 cut in power prices promised. We've actually seen you're now saying 56 per cent. The Prime Minister is talk the, the, the question was a long question regarding prices of energy. The Prime Minister is directly relevant. He is referring to in his answer about the cost of energy. And I give him the call. I'm precisely talking about the price of energy, which is very much related to whether there is investment in new energy or not. I know that might be too complex for those opposite, but here's what the chief executive of NEON, the French group, has to, had to say uh, just this week. Just this week about the investment in new energy, which will have an impact up to 2030. This is what he had to say about 2025. This is what he had to say. We are the largest renewable player in the country and we want to quadruple in size before the end of the decade. We are going to double now between now and 2025 and we are going to double again before the end of the decade. There will be hundreds of jobs coming from these new investments. The good thing is that renewable energy is part of the solution. We have a cost of production that is much lower than energy sources. So what we're seeing as a direct result of the policy that we have is more England. investment, is more investment, more investment, which is, as the chief executive of NEON have to say, much lower than other energy sources, something that those opposite don't seem to understand. I give the call to the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Why is a National Anti Corruption Commission so long overdue? Order. I give the call 
to the Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Higgins for her question. The Commonwealth is the last jurisdiction in Australia to implement an anti-corruption commission. Due to the inaction of the former Liberal National Government, we have been left behind while the states and territories have moved ahead. I would like to remind the House that the people of Australia were promised a national anti-corruption commission in December 2018. Who might have made that promise? Well, I think it might have been the former Prime Minister and the former Attorney General. And this is what they said. I quote, a new Commonwealth Integrity Commission will take the lead on detecting and stamping out any corrupt and criminal behaviour by Commonwealth employees. End quote. But as we all know, the former government did not establish any such national anti-corruption commission. By the time of the election in May 2022, they had not even bothered to introduce a bill to this parliament. It has been left to the Albanese Labor government to answer the clear message from the Australian people and deliver the anti-corruption commission that the Australian people have asked for. This week we are getting on with that job. The bills which are being debated in the House today have benefited from the experience of the existing state and territory commissions over the last three decades. Our national model draws on the best elements of those bodies and learns from any shortcomings. Our National Anti-Corruption Commission has also benefited from the scrutiny of parliamentary committees. Today I circulated government amendments that draw on recommendations from two of those committees to further strengthen our bills. Among other things, these amendments will strengthen protections for journalists in relation to search warrants and protection of sources. We have listened to concerns from the media sector and their advocates and we have acted, because that is what good government does. We want the new Anti-Corruption Commission, when it is established, to have the best chance of success with as broad a base of support as possible. Part of securing that support is acting cooperatively, listening to feedback and taking it on board. I am proud that the bills being debated today and the government amendments reflect that cooperation and our willingness to work with all sides of the parliament and stakeholders to make the National Anti-Corruption Commission the best it can be. I'll give the call to the member for Ryan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Minister, last week in Egypt you said that if we're not trying to keep to 1.5 degrees, then what are we here for? Because the difference between 1.5 and 1.7 degrees in terms of the impact on the planet is enormous. Minister, why then has your government adopted policies that are not compatible with keeping warming to 1.5 degrees, such as the more than $40 billion in the budget for fossil fuel subsidies, including the gas and petrochemical hub in Darwin Harbour and a new gas project in Victoria. Here, here. Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. And yes, the difference between 1.5 and 1.7 is enormous in terms of the impact on the world and the impact on Australia. That's why we're fighting so hard. I mean, Mr Speaker, Australia is the country with the most developed country with the most to lose from climate change. We are the country most exposed in the developed world to natural disasters. If climate change is unchecked, the black summer bushfires, which we so devastatingly experienced in 2019, will be the average by 2040. That's what's at stake here. And the floods that so many Australians are experiencing now will become, as they already are, more and more common, Mr Speaker. So that's why we did fight so hard last week to maintain the commitment to 1.5 degrees. And that's why we are working so hard to implement, in just 85 months, our 2030 target. 85 months is not long for a task of this size. It would have been better if we'd started 10 or 12 years ago, Mr Speaker, but we're starting in 2022. Uh, to meet this 2030 target. So that's why this is important. Now, the honourable member asks about uh, certain projects. The Greens moved yesterday a disallowance of one of those projects in the other place, and we opposed that. And I'll tell you why we opposed it, Mr. Speaker, because this is a point of difference with the Greens party, because contracts have been signed on that project. This was a decision taken by the previous government, not a decision I would have taken, 
not a grant we would have made, but contracts have been signed. And one thing this side of politics won't do is rip up contracts that have been signed by governments. We will respect that, and we won't create sovereign risk, Mr. Speaker. That is a genuine difference with the, with the, with the Greens Party. So yes, we will. We will oppose disallowances like that, where they bring into question sovereign risk, because we want Australia to be a renewable energy export powerhouse. And to do that, you need to be a reliable partner, Mr. Speaker. You need to have credibility in the export markets. You need to know. If the all government signs a contract, it will be on it. And, Mr. Speaker, the other thing we need, if we are going to be a renewable energy uh, powerhouse, is the capacity to export green hydrogen and ammonia. And to do that, you need to invest in our ports and in our gas facilities in our ports to be able to export that green hydrogen when the technology allows. We need to make those investments now. Well, we won't be a renewable energy superpower, Mr. Speaker. We say we've got a hydrogen strategy in Australia, and we do. So do 20 other countries. So we need to be constantly investing to increase our capacity not only to generate green hydrogen but to, but to export it. And that's exactly what we'll continue to do, Mr Speaker. So there are some points of differences with the Greens on this. We will not rip up contracts. We will protect sovereign risk. Even if they are decisions we would not have made in office, as this one is, we will continue to ensure that that important matter of sovereign risk is protected. Give the call to the member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Water. On the 10th anniversary of the Murray-Darling Basin plan becoming law, how is the Albanese Labor government delivering on the plan and working to protect our precious river system? What problems have arisen since the plan was signed into law? The call to the Minister for the Environment and Water. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Macon for that question. Ten years ago, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was signed into law, and it was the most important piece of water policy that this country has ever made, and it still leads the world in terms of water policy. It may seem like a very strange time to be talking about water scarcity and drought when we see the devastation that the Prime Minister was describing earlier in question time. And of course, <laughs> Our thoughts are with those individuals and communities who have been affected by these massive floods, lives lost, property destroyed. But one thing we know for sure about Australia is, sure as night follows day, there will be another drought, and we need to be ready for that when it happens. The plan was constructed at a different time during the millennium development, sorry, during the brutal millennium drought that made it necessary, and it was the good work of the member for Watson that made that plan possible. And a decade on, I am pleased to say that we have made real and meaningful progress when it comes to the Murray-Darling system. In the most recent drought, environmental water kept rivers flowing, it flooded wetlands, it, it gave hope. It gave hope to communities that saw dry riverbeds otherwise. In the south, the environmental flows helped flush 3.3 million uh, of tonnes of salt out through the mouth of the Murray and into the ocean. Without the plan, we wouldn't have seen these results, and that 2017-2019 drought would have been so much worse. But we have to acknowledge that this has been because of the genuine sacrifice of Murray-Darling Basin communities, and our thanks and acknowledgements have to go to those communities. Well, We've still got a challenge. We need to deliver this plan in full, and those opposite have veered from sabotage to scare campaigns. That's been their only response to the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. There are 450 gigalitres of additional environmental water promised two gigalitres delivered by those opposite, 100 dams promised by those opposite, two gigalitres. Two, uh, two dams delivered by those opposite. Uh, the minister will resume her seat. The uh, manager of opposition business on a point of order. Well, Mr. Speaker, on relevance, uh, in question time, you previously directed the minister to be relevant to the question where the minister has strayed and begun talking about the record of the former government. I ask well, that you direct the minister back to being directly relevant. Thank you to the for question. the point of order. The question did include what problems have been encountered. The minister is addressing that part of the question, and I ask her to return to her answer, but I will listen carefully as she concludes her answer. 
Thank you. It's, it's ironic, isn't it, that those having achieved so little over the last nine years are prepared to, to sit here and heckle. We know that full the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is necessary. It's only one side of this parliament that is fully committed to working with the states and territory to deliver in full on the Basin Plan. It's good for communities, it's good for farmers, it's good for irrigators, it's good for the environment. We know that it's only full delivery of the Basin Plan that will save our river systems and the communities that depend on them. Give the call to the member for Flynn. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How many private properties will be impacted by the construction of transmission lines affecting the power grid in central and southern Queensland under Labor's energy policy? Order the member for Morton will cease interjecting. Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member asked me how many properties will be impacted by transmission projects in Queensland. We haven't announced any. We haven't done any deals with Queensland under rewiring the nation. The, the, the deals we've announced are with Tasmania and Victoria. So the answer to the honourable member's question in that regard is none, Mr. Speaker. We will have discussions. We will have discussions with the Queensland government, of course, because we understand that transmission is important, Mr. Speaker. We understand that transmission is necessary to get. In, uh, renewable energy to where it's used. Uh, I, I know that I'm not the only person who thinks that, Mr. Speaker. The uh, former member for, uh, Minister for Energy brought down a, an instrument. He was very good at that, Mr. Speaker, signing instruments. It was, he, he, ran, he ran a nice line of signing instruments, Mr. Speaker. He did it very often. Um, but this was actually a good one that he signed. What this one wasn't hiding energy price rises. This one was, uh, this one was facilitating transmission lines. And in that, in that regulation, he said. These projects, that is transmission projects throughout Australia, will be critical to deliver low cost, reliable and secure energy to consumers, Mr Speaker. That's what he said in the regulation. And he didn't stop there. He gave a big yeah, speech. He gave a big speech, a keynote speech, Mr say, Speaker. Well, it was a keynote. It wasn't any, wasn't any old speech, Mr Speaker. This one. This was a keynote speech. It wasn't that long ago, on the 18th of March 2022. And he said. The development of interconnectors and transmission is critical to bring new generation capacity into the energy system, while shoring up reliability and affordability across state borders. He went on to say, Mr. Speaker, this is the best bit: thousands of kilometres of new transmission is likely to be needed to connect new generation and deliver reliable and affordable energy across the national market. I mean, what's the changed? Leader of the March, Nationals. And November, Mr. Speaker, he's sitting on the other side of the chamber. It's the only thing that's changed, Mr. Speaker. If hypocrisy generated energy, the grid would be fine. Thanks to the member for you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, we need to get the transmission built to get energy to the grid. I mean, Snowy 2.0, their signature policy, they've forgot to connect to the grid. It's not plugged on, plugged in. I don't know how they think the energy is going to get to the grid. Carrier pigeons, maybe, taking the, the electrons to the national energy market, Mr. Speaker. We will fix their mess by building the transmission. We'll get on with the job of rewiring the nation. We've done more in six months than they did in ten years, already delivering the Mariners League funding deal, already delivering a deal with Victoria, and we will engage with other governments to deliver rewiring the nation because that's what the nation needs. Good question. Member, member for O'Connor. I give a call to the member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. How does the Albanese Labor government's budget address years of waste and years of rorts and provide increased infrastructure funding for regional Australia that can actually be delivered? I give the call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the member for Robertson for both the question and also hosting me in the Central Coast last week? The Albanese government's budget delivers for our regions. We're doing the hard work of delivering a responsible pipeline of investment, cleaning up the mess left by those opposite in the infrastructure investment pipeline, whilst increasing funding for regional projects through that pipeline. In the October budget, this investment has increased by around $4 billion compared to what was promised and planned by those opposite. 
And in the recent Senate estimates hearings, it was confirmed that in the infrastructure investment pipeline over a 10-year period, over 51.9 per cent of projects are being delivered in our regions, more than, again, what was planned by the, those opposite. In, in terms of the forward estimates and the dollar amounts, projects in regional Australia received 34.2 per cent of funding in the infrastructure investment pipeline, and that compares with 33.6 per cent under those opposites. So we're doing more. Over a 10-year period, in fact, the difference is even greater. In the member for Robertson's own electorate, not only are we delivering $40 million to upgrade and improve local roads against, around the central coast, We've also allocated some $30 million to upgrade of Oka Drive and will be funding much needed upgrades to facilities at Frost Reserve in Concumber, which I visited. Through the budget, in stark contrast to the way in which the previous government operated, we have also committed to topping up the local roads and community investment funds, specifically for regional and rural roads, because we acknowledge and understand just how much pressure our regional roads are under. That takes the local roads and community investment program in this round to almost three quarters of a billion dollars, and particularly that top up for regional road communities. During my visit to Robertson, I also visited play spaces at Ross Park, Avoca Beach, and Caramba Reserve in Saratoga, all projects that are funded under that program. I also, of course, had the pleasure of visiting the entrance ocean baths with the member for Dobell, where we're funding improvements, including improving the baths and a waterfront plaza play space. I also visited the Hunter region, where we're investing substantially there—$269 million for the Musselbrook bypass, $38.6 million for the much-needed Colsons Creek Road upgrade and $10.5 million to the Musselbrook Town Centre, an Remember incredibly important precinct uh, that partly was funded under the previous government, and we're now making sure that those connections are actually made to improve the community in an incredibly important community as it transitions. We've provided, uh, again, improvements for the Musselbrook bypass alone will improve safety. And again, this is about delivering in a much more transparent way, delivering better, delivering for our regions, and that's what the Albanese government will continue to do. Call to the member for Casey. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure. Can the minister explain why Labor is providing $2.2 billion for the Melbourne Suburban Rail Loop before the Victorian state election, which ignores their own policy by proceeding without an Infrastructure Australia assessment, and at the same time cancelling the $110 million Wellington Road duplication project in South East Melbourne, which they promised in 2019? I give, I give I give the call to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thank you very much uh, for the member's question. And I will take a, a minute to talk a little bit about Wellington Road, but first let me talk about the importance of the suburban rail loop. This is a once-in-a-generation infrastructure Order. investment in Victoria. This is not just about the suburbs, but also for the member for Gippsland. It will substantially improve the capacity of people who live in Gippsland to go to things like Monash University, to attend the Monash Children's Hospital and actually make sure that they can get to those the important The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. We know the suburban rail loop will transform our suburbs and that regional Victorians will benefit from that as well. The detailed business and investment case for the suburban rail loop, released by Victoria last year, demonstrated that a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7, meaning $1.70, would be returned for every dollar invested. The for Deacon, we also know, the which for the Aston. member seems to not understand, that the member seems to not understand that under the National Land Transport Act, that the project is also subject to rigorous assessment processes between the Commonwealth and Victoria. That is what is required when we have those national partnership agreements. And the member asked me about projects being funded without infrastructure investment. And I know the member wasn't here at the time, but I do remind the member of the $5 billion that was committed to the Melbourne Airport Rail Loop. From the, without actually the previous government speaking to the Victorian Premier first, and the $1.6 billion commitment for the Brisbane to Sunshine Coast Rail that the Queensland government described as a bit of a surprise and the money appeared plucked from the sky. But again, the member's question provides me with the opportunity Order. to remind us, the House, just what a mess 
just what an absolute mess that this government, the previous government made of the infrastructure investment pipeline that we are having to clean up. The Wellington Road project that the member refers to, the previous government said they would fund 100 per cent of it. The duplication of Wellington Road, 100 per cent. The only problem was they only put $110 million into what is approximately a $620 million project. That is the problem. It says everything about the previous government that the member does not understand what it actually takes to invest Deakin and, and deliver the project. Aston. As I've said previously, you can't drive on a press release. Give the call to the member for Solomon. Can the Prime Minister inform the House of the consequences of the earthquakes in Honiara and Java? Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Solomon for his question and his long-standing interest, particularly in Indonesia, but also in the Pacific. Mr. Speaker, this morning there was a 5.6 magnitude earthquake in Java. Media have reported at least 162 people have lost their lives. More than 700 have been injured. It is estimated that some 13,000 people have been displaced, with more than 2,000 homes damaged. I have uh, conveyed uh, through to uh, my friend President Widodo Australia's condolences at this tragic loss of life and uh, we have, will stand ready to provide our friends in Indonesia with support, as Australia always does. As Australia always does. Uh, in Honiara this morning, there was a 7.3 magnitude earthquake at 10 kilometre de depth. Uh, there are reports of aftershocks. All staff of the Australian High Commission are safe. There are no known injuries, but the roof of the High Commission Annex has collapsed, which would point to likely damage throughout the city. Staff have been moved to higher ground because there was a tsunami warning uh, that was issued. Our High Commission is seeking to confirm the safety of all Australians in the Solomons. There are difficulties because phone lines have gone down, so there are communication difficulties there. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has stood up a consular emergency task force to lead consular response and support. Solomon Islands Police are out doing damage assessment. Uh, we've placed someone in the National Disaster Response Centre to assist with the initial response. Uh, we have contacted uh, Prime Minister Sogavaro to once again uh, indicate that Australia stands ready to assist. We have, of course, historically played an important role in the Solomon Islands. Uh, can I say, uh, Mr Speaker, that anyone with concerns for uh, Australians uh, in the Solomons can contact the, the Consular Emergency Centre on, if they're in Australia, uh, 1300 555 135. I repeat that number, 1300 triple five one three five or if they're outside Australia plus six one two six two six one three three oh five that's plus six one two six two six one three three oh five uh, we await uh, further news uh, Senator Wong uh, will be giving a statement uh, to the Senate uh, around about now uh, as well. Uh, I just hope that uh, not just that all Australians are safe. I think that I can speak on behalf of uh, the House to say that we hope that the impact of this devastating uh, earthquake uh, is, uh, is, is minimised and we stand ready to provide support. And, and, and after this, Mr Speaker, I'll ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Call to the, de uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for the update uh, in relation to the situation. Extend our condolences uh, in particular to the families in Java who have lost loved ones and those in Solomon Islands that will be panicking about where their loved ones are in some circumstances right now. Uh, it's a harrowing experience. In 2018, we were in Lombok uh, and there was an earthquake there. And To see the devastation to the local people, to the infrastructure, 
which of course in many cases just not built to the standards that we would see here in Australia and the loss of life, the loss of livelihood for many of those people in villages and in the cities uh, is quite devastating and I don't know the extent of the damage yet but it will require assistance from Australia no doubt and as the Prime Minister rightly points out our country will always stand with our near neighbours, with people in our region, in particular those from the Solomon Islands, from Indonesia and elsewhere, will always provide them with support uh, in their hour of need. And to our people on the ground, uh, we have many staff, of course, in, uh, in the Solomon Islands uh, at the moment, so we wish them every safe passage, and I'm sure that they will be part of the response uh, and the recovery and the support to uh, those within the community. Uh, we will lend any support uh, to the government to, uh, to make sure that we can respond in the appropriate way, as I say, as we've done in the past and as we will always do. Just call the Prime Minister. Yes, Mr Speaker. On, on, on indulgence briefly, on a, on a much more pleasant uh, note, I rise to wish the Socceroos all the best. The World Cup uh, campaign for uh, the World Game. Uh, begins in Qatar for Australia tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Uh, with the match against the reigning world champions France. Uh, we wish all of the Socceroos all of all of the best uh, tomorrow. And uh, many of us, of course, will be up up watching. Uh, it is a sport, of course, which we host the World Cup of in 2023. And along with New Zealand, that will be. An important event. It will actually be one of the largest sporting events ever hosted here in Australia. And on behalf of uh, the government, but I think the parliament as well, we wish uh, our Socceroos all the best. Uh, and on indulgence, the leader. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you uh, to the Prime Minister for uh, advising a few moments ago that he was intending uh, to make those comments. And uh, obviously, we wish the Socceroos all the very best uh, in what will be a tough match, but, uh, but nonetheless they've got a great fighting spirit and we wish them every success uh, tomorrow morning and, uh, and through the course of the tournament as well. Uh, also take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge uh, in the other World Cup that's just taken place in rugby league uh, this, the, the work of the Kangaroos and the Gillaroos as well, both successful in the Gillaroos case, the third successive year uh, that they've been able to win. Of course, I'll mention uh, Ali Brigginshaw, who's a Broncos player, but was uh, the player of the match. And, also, a uh, special mention of uh, Mel Meninga and others, James uh, Tradesco and others, who have done a fantastic job in our country's name and wish uh, all of those who are still celebrating uh, every success they'll return home at some stage when, uh, when it's appropriate for them to do so.